ASUS ROG Phone 2. The phone with every spec maxed out, the absolute dream phone on paper. So the question is, how well do specs on paper translate to real world use in a phone? And this is pretty much the perfect phone to find that out. This is one of those phones that people have sent me a whole lot to check out because, well, I made that dream phone video a little while back where I had all these crazy specs that I wanted to see in a phone. And then Asus announced this and the spec sheet. And people said, oh, Marquez, it looks like they made basically your dream phone. So I picked it up and I've been using it. I brought it to the Apple event and I've been using this phone for more than a week now and I can tell you exactly what I think. But this is the spec sheet. I just, I just wanna put this in one place for all of you who will appreciate this. Just listen to this world-class spec sheet. Snapdragon 855 Plus, 12 gigs of RAM, one terabyte of UFS 3.0 storage, a 6.6 .6 inch, 120 hertz OLED display, a 6,000 milliamp hour battery, and 48 megapixel dual cameras. On paper, this is the best phone you can buy in almost every metric. Best chip, most RAM, biggest storage, fastest display, biggest battery, straight across the board, and with room still for a headphone jack. So how does absolutely dominating a spec sheet actually translate to real world use? Spoiler, pretty good. So first of all, the design, the package that you stuff all the specs into. It's pretty similar to the first ROG phone. They've toned it down a little bit. You know, there's a little less copper, a little less thin action, but it's still unmistakably a gaming phone, of course. The aesthetic isn't subtle. And the design is a bit more subjective. It's not really on the spec sheet. This is just what it looks like if you're cool carrying around a phone that looks like this or not. And there's a certain type of person that will be. I will say the number one thing you'll notice, more than the glowing logo, more than the vent cut out for cooling, more than the circuit lines and the design that reflect rainbow or glow colors, is that it's just absolutely huge. Like there are small phones and there are big phones. This is a huge phone. You, you need a big footprint to fit all of these specs. And then since it's made mostly of metal, which is dense, and with that battery, this is a really heavy phone, about 240 grams to be exact. And you really feel that weight in your pocket and holding this thing. I'm cool with it. I like big phones, but you might have to see it or hold it in person to really like actually feel how big it is. That's what she said. And then from there, a lot of the design choices are made specifically with the gamer in mind, but a lot of them just end up being nice for people who just like media in general. So things like the USB type C port is down on the side here, so you can still charge it while holding the phone sideways and it doesn't get in the way. There are also dual front facing stereo speakers and they are incredible speakers. You know, in a world where headphone jacks are slowly dying off, but being replaced by wireless audio, the dual stereo front facing speaker set is also an endangered species, and I'd like to bring awareness to that. And there really isn't much of a great replacement. They're just worse speakers now. But yeah, these are really good, crisp, loud, and clear. So overall, the design, of course, isn't for everyone. In fact, I prefer something a little cleaner, a little bit more understated, but there is a lot of good choices here, so I can respect that. So okay, then the specs. Uh, first main specs are Snapdragon 855 Plus and 12 gigs of DDR4 RAM. So of course it's gonna be extremely fast. Launching apps and then keeping a lot of them in memory and flipping through them. Yeah, ha having the highest end available specs here does great. Um, but then there actually are some other things that make it feel even faster. Number one is the UFS 3.0 storage. It's really fast storage that's helped phones like the OnePlus 7 Pro and the Galaxy Fold feel much faster, including installing apps really quickly and launching apps really quickly. And then number two is this display. It's a 6.6 .6 inch, 120 hertz AMOLED 1080p panel. And so saying that out loud is, that's a pretty unique spec sheet. That's a great number, but you gotta actually look at it. It is a very fast display. Actually, the fastest mobile display that I've ever seen. You can turn it down to the normal 60 hertz if you want. You can bump it up to 90 hertz or just keep it at 120 all the time like I did. And it also has a 240 hertz touch response refresh. So it's super quick and responsive to your touch. Scrolling, for example, is super smooth. You of course can't really fully appreciate it through this video, which is only 30 FPS, but I guess take my word for it, it's really snappy, I think is the key word. Very smooth and snappy. So scrolling, the UI, and any app, of course, that supports the higher frame rate look awesome. There's a whole list of games that support it, but I've said it once and I'll say it again, 
high refresh rate, all the things, please. But it's not the best looking OLED in the world. It's 1080p for one, which on a 6.6 .6 inch screen is not a huge deal, but it's worth noting. Like it's not a low resolution, it's still almost 400 PPI, but versus a 1440p display, you can tell the difference. And then colors and contrast just felt a little strange to me at times. It has adjustable color profiles, but I never quite felt happy with the color calibration. Uh, it gets up to 600 nits, which is decently bright, but it doesn't get very dim at night, which I actually found much more annoying when it's dark and I wish my phone wasn't so freaking bright. It also has a fingerprint reader underneath the display glass and it's nowhere near the best ones I've used. It's not always glitchy, but it is glitchy more often than any other ones I've used. It is definitely optical as you can see, you know, with the light shining on my fingerprint as it tries to read it. And it also has this weird artifact that's kind of hard to capture, but at lower brightness, when you go to unlock with your fingerprint, the whole display sort of bumps up in brightness a little bit and gets really grainy and weird looking as it reads, then it just goes back to normal when it's done. It's not actually a problem or anything, but it's just a fascinatingly weird thing to see happen. So specs, it's got those for sure. But like always, you have to look a little bit past the numbers to find and, and see interesting things like that. But then speaking of numbers, here are some other numbers to think about up to a terabyte of built-in storage. So that's, that's pretty great. There is no expandable storage, but let's be real, you probably don't need more than a terabyte. So that number translates pretty well. And then 6,000. This is a 6,000 milliamp hour battery. And that, as you can imagine, also translates really well. That is the biggest battery I've ever used in any smartphone. Even at 120 Hertz all the time, I've never gotten close to killing this phone in a day. On a super heavy day with me where I had a lot of unplugged navigation and music streaming, and I just intentionally never plugged in during the day, I ended the day after 10 p.m. with about five hours of screen on time and half battery left. Wow. just. I, I don't know, it's my dream smartphone battery. Literally never ever worrying about if I'm gonna have to charge during the day and then just plug it in every night. Uh, you could probably go on a weekend road trip and not bring your charger and come back two days later with like 30% battery for real. And if you're ever worried for some reason, you're gonna have to go like four straight days without charging. Like this is the dream scenario for a battery in a smartphone. You could just turn it down to 90 Hertz or turn it down to 60 Hertz and you're good for a while, so. Yeah, this is, uh, that number, 6,000, translates very well. Then here's another number, 48. It's a 48 megapixel primary camera on the back at f1.79. This turns out is one of those specs where you can just kind of ignore the number. Uh, you might be tempted to believe 48 megapixels automatically means it's good, uh, but this, you know, it's a decent camera. I'd give it a B, B minus for quality. Maybe with great software tuning or Gcam, it could get up to a B plus, but it's not blowing anyone's minds here. Images can look pretty good when you give them a lot of light, of course, and it does have great HDR, but sharpness and color I've noticed and white balance are more inconsistent. They can hit or miss. And there's actually a bit of noticeable shutter lag, which I thought was strange for a phone that's otherwise so incredibly fast. But it also has a 13 megapixel ultra wide at 125 degree field of view. And similar to some other phones, I'm glad it has one, but the inconsistency between the two cameras, especially as far as color and sharpness and detail is major. So, you know, it's an extra fun camera to have, but clearly not as high quality. This has kind of been one of the themes I've noticed about gaming phones though, is that people who use these don't really take a ton of photos or care as much about the critical quality of photos and videos. So the cameras are just good enough. Matter of fact, for reference, Asus sent me a, a reviewer's guide for the phone just to go over all the features and things I should check out. It's 41 pages long and the camera stuff is not talked about at all until page 36. So, you know, I do actually wanna give Asus major props or something though. So if you remember the first Asus ROG phone, that software was a little bit over the top, the, the themes and the icons, very gamery and the, the mechanical sounds, and it was a bit much. So I, I did criticize it a bit in that first video. Well, in the ROG Phone 2, when you first set it up, you get the option to choose between that very heavy ROG UI or this sort of near stock, clean Zen UI. And that is what I like to see. I am now happy with the software experience on the ROG Phone 2. I of course chose the new Zen UI, and so there's no gouty icons or robot sound effects or anything crazy like that. It's something closer to maybe like an Oxygen OS or any other light skin on Android. Not sure about the upgrade schedule still. Uh, Android 10 is starting to roll out 
and it's just kind of a pixel thing for right now, but I'm impressed with what we have here so far. There are still plenty of gaming features, of course, though. It wouldn't be a Republic of Gamers phone without that. There's still the Armory Crate and game modes, Game Genie, X mode, the system lighting control. It's all still here, don't worry. Um, there's even improved air triggers on each side of the phone for gaming and landscape. But if I'm being perfectly real, I don't play a whole ton of like really intense games on my phone. I don't play Fortnite on my phone. So like, I guess it says something that even a phone that's not targeted directly to me has still been so enjoyable to use. This is a really great phone. Now it's probably still gonna go a bit under the radar just because it's not gonna be in carrier stores and it's a gamer phone by a smaller company so it feels much more niche. But if you get excited about this type of thing or if you're a gamer on your phone or if you just saw the spec sheet and went, that looks sick, then you are squarely in the target demographic of people who will really enjoy using this. It's not perfect, you know, there are small trade-offs. The cameras aren't world-class. Uh, the all-metal body is solid, of course, and it's gonna be heavy, uh, but it also means no wireless charging. And there's also no official water resistance or IP rating. And the phone's Achilles heel really is just the size of the damn thing. So here we are at the end of the review. And if you're finding yourself sitting there thinking, wow, I really wanna know if I can tell the difference between that 120 hertz and 90 hertz versus 60 with my eye, and I can't wait to play these games at high frame rates. Yeah, you'll love this phone, you know? So turns out the spec king on paper does deliver in real life. And it also turns out design is very important. But let me know what you think. Do just the specs make it the dream phone or would you buy this phone just for the specs over something a little more tame? I'm curious what you think, let me know. Either way, thank you for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.